Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Maeva. So, um, yeah, the session that we're going to have now is uh, we're going to talk about learning and we're going to talk about networks. And uh, actually, this conversation already started like a couple of hours ago at the studio. We, we were talking about, with Perestroika about the learning process of, um, of uh, how the education, uh, educational systems seems to have the same, the same way of uh, teaching as they have it in the Industrial Revolution. It seems like technology and digitalization didn't change anything for them. And on the other side, at the studio as well, we were talking about networks and how uh, those are the new model of organization that actually are able to face the challenges that are uh, changing environment that we are. So, and there's something really magical about these networks. I believe I belong to one, to, to Wisher, and, and I think um, this network has like a magic power to attract people and uh, they are willing to contribute with their, with their time, with their knowledge, and sometimes with, with their own money. And um, I think also that uh, this uh, magical power is very related with the opportunity of learning that uh, these networks are providing to the, to the contributors. So this session is gonna, we're going to explore how uh, this informal learning process is taking place in these networks and why it's so powerful for, for the contributors. And for that, we have uh, our lovely guest that I'm going to introduce you right now. All of uh, three of them has um, their contributors in different networks, and also they, uh, they live in uh, educational projects. So the first one is uh, Felipe Anguinoni. I don't pronounce it very Italian. <laughs> So um, he was selected uh, one of the Brazilian 50 most inno innovative uh, marketing professionals. Felipe has a background as advertising, musician, screenwriter, actor, and comedian. His fields of studies are entrepreneurship, creativity, education, and comedy thinking. He is the co-founder of uh, Perestroika, and at the same time, Perestroika is one of the networks of, of a project called uh, Neo Tribes. Uh, Perestroika is one of the, the networks that we're going to talk about. Then the second one is uh, Gina Rember. Um, Gina is uh, deeply committed to blending approaches from the world of lean, design, startups, well-being, science, and tech through an experiment-centric approach. Gina is a core member of Inspiral, which is the second uh, network that we're going to talk about. And she's also the leader of uh, Lifehack, which is like a... Um, an initi a social initiative that is seeking to improve youth uh, well-being in New Zealand. And the third one is uh, our lovely Estelio Bercera. <laughs> he is a, um, a value seeker and a sea lover. He always talks about uh, surfing and, and the sea and the water. And, and he's also an innovation project professional. He's always on the run for the next challenge in value-driven innovation. He's the co-founder of uh, Cocoon Projects, the third network that we're going to talk about. And now they're launching a new project which uh, with uh, has to do with a growth, it's a growth program that temporarily is named Endor, but probably it's going to change the name. So, welcome. So yeah, the, the first thing that I, I would like to ask you is that uh, if you can explain very briefly what is the activity or the, what is about the networks that you belong, where you are contributors, and, um, and also I, I would like also to understand what is the process when someone comes into your network and want to belong to it, what is the process when someone becomes a contributor? So uh, do you all have a mic, right? You, should you start with Perestroika? Hello. Hi, guys. Hello. How are you? Don't mind me standing up, but I feel I communicate much better this way, so excuse me and sorry if I broke any protocols. And I'm Felipe. I'm the co-founder of Perestroika. And what is Perestroika? It's a school in Brazil. What kind of school? It's a free school, as in free-spirited, free-minded school, an independent school of creative activities. It's not a school for kids. It's kind of an extension courses and programs. We don't have school for kids yet, 
although we're working on that right now as we speak. And uh, underlying all programs and courses that we do, that we put together, there's an original methodology called experience learning, which my friend and partner Jean-Philippe Rosier explained briefly at the studio a couple of, of hours ago. Was anyone in there? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, in a nutshell, experience learning is a methodology that focuses on transforming the learning process into something really fun and entertaining and exciting. This is an original methodology that we crafted, we developed, we tested it, and finally we published it under one of the most permissives. You got that? Permissivos. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, license of creative on um, Creative Commons. So, um, in the last 10 years, this methodology has directly impacted over 20,000 people in Brazil uh, through over 100 courses and programs we put together. Very, very weird courses, from creative processes to futurism, from um, the, uh, comedy thinking to skateboarding for girls, from post-feminism to professional poker. Um, uh, in the core of all courses we put together and in the core of, in fact, everything we do, there's four common things. The first is a strong belief in the paradigm shift. Secondly, um, a post-digital revolution contemporary mindset. Third, uh, brutal incentive of self-empowerment and entrepre entrepreneurship, and I always get that word wrong, entrepreneurship, is that right? And fourth, um, a subversive, hardcore, punk rock, underground approach to all issues we address. So this is kind of like the front end of Pedestrica. But what credentiates me for this panel is the back office, where we have created another methodology, a system, a program called PCC, which stands for Growth Cycles Program in Portuguese. Um, and that uh, works in the way that every time we hire someone, we say, okay, we're hiring you, Anna. We're hiring you, Gina. You're hired. You're gonna start working for Pedestrika now. And this is your salary, this is your benefits, and blah, 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 blah. But this, for us, is just a mere formality so we can be within the legal boundaries of the Brazilian bureaucratic system, which is a very tough system that has uh, needs uh, objective, which is to guarantee uh, the, the, the workers' rights, but it also makes uh, enterprising very hard. So this is a mere formality. We want you to think that you just got a scholarship for an accelerating process in this company. And this scholarship is not because Pedestrica is a school. If we were a restaurant, it would still work because we're talking about the back office. It's kind of a career plan 2.0. So uh, for, the la for the next year, year and a half, two years, the three years, you go you're gonna be going through a five cycle process and you're gonna be accelerated and incubated as an uh, entrepreneur. So you are going to learn our culture, learn our methodology. This is a learn by doing process, so you have to self-manage yourself. You're gonna have mentorship, you're gonna have uh, facilitation, but you're gonna learn how to program and manage a course by programming and managing a course. And we are gonna hook you up with, three, every three months we have a um, feedback session, and we are going to see how well you are developing. And when you get to the fifth level, the fifth cycle, you have the final assignment, which is to create a beta project, an MVP, of a future business. And if that works out, you're gonna be welcome to be our business partner in this venture. So that was implement, implemented on December of 2013. And since then, we uh, grew from four business partners and three business units to 13 business partners and 13 business units. Including, we have a very cool example here, which is Dudu. Please, Dudu, stand up and 
show you your face to everybody. Dudu went from intern to business partner in one year and three months period. So I hope I addressed your question right. Sure. Tina. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think it's also really nice we're sitting on stage together because I think it couldn't be more different uh, to how it works at Inspiral and at Lifehack, actually. So um, my name is Gina. I've come over from New Zealand. Um, I'm originally from Berlin, so it's really nice being in Europe and being close to home. So I really appreciate being here. Thanks for the invite as well. Um, I guess I'm here with two different versions of this, one of which is the network that I see as my learning network, which is the Inspiral network, and the one which I'm creating with and for and on behalf of other people, uh, which is Lifehack in my, in my mind. So Inspiral in itself is a network of social entrepreneurs who are working alongside uh, and with one another to create ventures with a positive social and environmental impact, going across anything from um, democracy to online decision making to education, um, and in our case, uh, in, in Lifehack's case, youth well-being. Uh, so overall, Lifehack uh, is, yeah, is one of the, I think, about 13 ventures that are currently part of the network, which involves um, sort of like a mutual value exchange around learnings and support um, and generally best practice or whatever you want to call it in terms of um, working out how we're, where we're going and how we're getting there. Uh, so in, in Lifehack's instance, like Anna was saying in the introduction, there's a really strong commitment to um, experimentation and through that meaningfully improve youth well-being in New Zealand, which um, despite its very sort of clean and green image has actually got one of the highest uh, youth suicide rates in the OECD uh, according to some 2011 statistics. So there's a lot of things going on in New Zealand that um, need addressing in the sort of social wicked problem space and Life is one of the government funded initiatives that is aiming to do something a bit different about that. Um, and the way in which we're going about it is to run different programs and events and workshops of different shapes and sizes and lengths uh, that essentially vary in intensity. And we have tried anything from running a, an online course to a five-week fully immersive residential full-time program. Uh, and the most recent thing we experimented with was a three-month program last year where people came together at three different instances in the beginning, the middle, and the end and returned to their communities in between. Um, but essentially what we do is put on programs for other people to accelerate their own learning pathway um, in a way. So the way of joining, to get back to the original question mm -hmm. as well, I guess, is... Um, can be very different. In Inspiral in itself, it's very, uh, very deep end. It's normally showing people showing up wanting to do something different, and as a result, uh, they're often prepared to try something in a different way. It means that there's people knocking and having coffees and having Skype chats who are saying, I'm interested in this bossless way of organizing. How do I get involved? And often we sort of throw a project their way and say, OK, here, here's a thing you can get involved with. Can you, can you help us with it, or can you run it? Uh, and through the process of figuring out how to do it, they learn about themselves, they learn about the network, and they work out whether or not it's for them. Uh, it was much similar for me when I first joined. Uh, I joined through a job at Lifehack, uh, and then also ran a couple of other smaller projects where it was very much clear that I had to work out the way in which to best run these projects uh, and make them successful. With Lifehack, people often um, join by applying to be part of a program or an event. Uh, they're often free, sometimes we charge, and it sort of varies, but we go through a rigorous application process for the more intense and longer term programs uh, to essentially try and assess people's need and readiness, is sort of how we frame it for um, personal change work that results in actual real world societal positive outcomes. Um, yeah, I think that, yeah, just to start. Okay, thank you. Stelio? All right, Stelio Verzera from Italy, Sicily actually, if it applies. So um, I'm co-running an organization, a company, ke, whose name is Cocoon Projects. What we've been doing in the last five years is helping organization in their evolution. So we provide services, basically. But since we've been so smart to crash a previous company, we had to try to design the new one in a better way. So we've been working like nine months. Then we came out with this organization model. It's called now known as Liquido which allow a couple of very interesting things that changed our life in, at work completely. 
going from not having any job interview any longer to giving people decisional power proportionally to the value they are creating in the governance of the company and a few other things. So we are co-managing basically the company. So in our situation, management is no longer a layer, it's, a, it's an action, it's an activity that is open to all the people. So, well, uh, to go straight to your question, I want to keep it short for the moment. Uh, in order to join Cocoon Projects, people just need to send an email at the moment, have a chat with any member to understand in which mess they are putting themselves and that they are in. We let them in through the governance of the company. So this is the first thing you have access, everything about how we're managing the company. And from there, you can move on and find what you prefer, you're more able to do or, 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 or where you can grow more. This is also another parameter that we see people choosing. So this is how people enter our organization. Right. So what I see is like uh, in the three cases is like basically put them, qui put them quickly into the, the experiencing mood, for I, I would say. But uh, in some cases, like in Price it's a little bit more managed. And, and in, in these other cases are much more like, uh, okay, jump into our projects and and de jump into the governance and just go in. Do you think that, because in, in your cases, there's not um, this uh, mentor or someone that is like a close involved with the, with the person? And do you think it will work? So what we have at Inspiral is actually as you join, so the two levels that we have currently, they're called a contributor. So a contributor to the network um, can be somebody who's invited or nominated by a member to join because they, they are mission aligned. It could be someone who we've met over a coffee or have known for a long time, it doesn't really matter. But um, when they get onboarded as a contributor, they get assigned what we call a member buddy. So members are the, the sort of inner core, or I mean, it's a network, so whatever, wh whatever way you wanna look at it. Um, but people who are more deeply engaged and committed to the network um, and the stewardship of the network, as well as the sort of, um, yeah, the governance of it it's, as well. And so people would have a member buddy assigned who's the person, who's the go-to person to say, okay. okay, this is roughly how you find your way around. We don't really have a map, but maybe speak to these two people or just sort of referring them on um, to make the, the, the conversations as useful as possible and find out uh, where they're best placed in the network. So there is a bit of guidance, but it's not as... Um, structured as in your case uh, and maybe I don't know what you have in terms of mentoring or buddying or whatever you want to call it as well. Well probably we are on the other end of the spectrum. We have uh, little formalities for that but we, what we've come to understand is that like the world is going back to what it was before the, the industrial revolution in many cases including this neo-tribal way of conceiving value creation. So basically, we create, we open spaces, we create space for that assistance for people in many different ways. One way can be a handle in the formal system, like somebody which helped you into, and so you can refer to that person, but then there are other experiences, occasions, or tools that can help you out without going into details. The important thing is that, and this is exactly where Endor comes in place, the important thing is that we are back to a kind of learning that is based on mastery. Mastery is something ancient that you cannot read and learn on a book. So you need people to work with you to develop that. Mm -hmm. And that includes the governance of a company and anything that where mastery is, is required, which is something quite different to what you can automate in an algorithm. So we're focusing on helping people through that mastery path. And actually, this is exactly the scope of uh, um, action of, of Endor, where mastery is mastery for your own life, mm -hmm. actually not for working within a specific company. Actually, you, you, go, you went into the second question. So the second question is like, uh, once you are in there, um, what, is, uh, what type of uh, tools, methodologies, spaces, this uh, y your networks provide to the contributors. I guess that uh, Endor is uh, some of them, but, but also before Endor, that is not even launched, uh, there's, there's something that is happening, like uh, gatherings that you do, or with the, uh, online tools, how all that works among the contributors, yeah. Okay, so uh, you're asking uh, how Ender was born, how Cocoon works, a lot of things actually. <laughs> but at the, very end, at the end of the day, it's quite simple. So you picture us in a, in a room with a board of a very big enterprise solving 
big problems for evolution of that enterprise or could be a no-profit organization, doesn't matter. So what we do actually is playing together. At the end of the day, what we do is playing together. Play is one of the most powerful ways of learning together. You can learn skills, you can learn social skills, social emotional skills, so it's quite wide. You can use what you know and what you also feel about something complex. So playing can be in very different ways. So I don't agree that agile stuff is about numbers. For example, it's a lot about people. And an agile retrospective meeting, for example, it's something that it, it's, it's a way of playing together about what was good and bad and how you can evolve from there. Then another thing could be the jam we have twice per year. So it's a big, uh, it falls in the large group intervention category, like open space technology, that kind of thing. So it's a big co-creation event. Or specific methodologies, like Lego Serious Play, for example. So there are quite a lot of things that you can do which are not formalizable. That's very important. I don't know if I made this, this word up, but it's, it yeah, gives the concept. Make you formal, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think in our instances, uh, so just to distinguish, I think for me, life act nearly feels uh, at a mini state. It's like a mini version of Inspiral in many ways. So I think a lot of the things that we're learning from Inspiral, we're applying it um, within the life act community, which is a lot younger. So Inspiral in itself is a network. Uh, is about five years old and Inspiral is about, um, Lifehack is about two years old at this stage. So uh, it's, there's a lot of um, exchange between the two for obvious reasons. Um, but something that both of them have in common is that we, uh, well, we've just started with Lifehack, but Inspiral has been doing it for five years really regularly, gathering in retreats twice a year, so one in the summer, one in the winter, as a opportunity and space to build trust between its members um, and trust and relationships for us are really important if we're trying to tackle some of the most wicked issues that we're coming across then how possibly can we do that if we don't trust the people who we're working with um, and it can also be a, a matter of proxy trust in a way so um, if I don't know you but somebody else I trust trusts you then um, already I can sort of start by assuming you're a good person and we should be working together in that sort of way. So it doesn't mean that I have to know every single person in the network, but retreats are one way to try and gather people in a physical space um, twice a year, which is then complemented by online tools. So we're using Slack, uh, we're using Lumio, which is one of the tools that we've, um, that one of the teams have built, which is an online collaborative decision-making platform. Um, and then it's also informal uh, practices and Rituals, so for example, I gather with a couple of other women once a month and we have a glass of wine and we just sort of talk about what's going on and what we're each learning and what we're going through. So it can be as formal or informal as we want. Um, and also, it's just all about reinventing um, what, how we make the network serve us and the work that we're doing. So um, I think it's also a matter of being flexible and just seeing um, what's coming up. And there's new people coming in suggesting new processes. So. Uh, for a while, we were running Project Kitchens quite regularly, which is a sort of a quite uh, time-bound practice of giving feedback on a project. Um, and so people come in and suggest new things all the time. We're sort of quite open to trying new things in terms of working out how we can ultimately build trust and relationships, because that, for us, is one of the sort of main parts of trying to do uh, the important work for all of us. <laughs> I don't even know how to start because we have so many uh, tools. Because I, I think it's becoming clear that it's very um, formalized, the process, and structured, the process we have in, in Pedestrika. Maybe because we, we started as a company, a pro, pro profit company, and we still are. And we started making this move when we were already like eight years uh, working. So we start with the hiring process which is a very, it's a very long process. We don't, we don't get any, there's no, okay, let's try this guy and see how it works out. So like the day zero, the person we selected, we know that that person is competent enough to deliver. He's a guy that I would invite to my birthday party, that I would like to grab a beer or smoke a joint. Oops, I said it. And uh, that I know that this guy, I want to be partner with him. So we have like a really long process before someone gets in, and we have a 60-day feedback where we, ha we, we have feedback every week or every 15 days to see how it's working. Then we have every three months feedback sessions to know if 
because each cycle we have like four really objective assignments that uh, we need to know if people uh, um, are checking that that out. So, uh, is he a team member? Is he? Uh, we say, uh, "Tamo junto." Uh, we're together, yeah. If he, he is someone that is going to help clean the bathroom if the bathroom is dirty, let's say. So is he, is he achieving that? We do that every three months. So we have like 13 points that is discussed, and the person then we see, okay, from the four assignments, you have 100% on these two, you're 80% on this one, and like 50% on this one. What are you going to do in the next three months to improve on those points, and he has to come up with a plan. So every time someone uh, moves into the next cycle, there's like a ritual for that. Um, what else? And in the personal level? In the personal level, how, how that works, like uh, the culture part. So this yeah. is more like at it's, the... Uh, when me and, and Tiago, who are the like, original co-founders, started, we said there's, there was only one thing that we would um, that we wouldn't discuss, which was Pedestrica has to be a family, and it has to be a family, and that we won't discuss. We will discuss any anything further. So we get together every day to drink because mm -hmm. we have drinks, at classes, and a lot of happy hours and meetings that are part of the program. So uh, there's a really uh, connected uh, bonding between people that, that are in the network. Also, the people that are managers or partners who, who have the responsibility of managing the, the business unit, we get together every two months for what we call immersion. So we stay like five days together in a beach house somewhere. So we work discuss operational problems, discuss financial problems, and discuss personal problems as well. Okay, so what I see is like uh, in, in the three of you, um, in the three cases that uh, you, you didn't go into details, but uh, I, I could see like uh, somehow uh, of reputation based on feedback or a value system where you are like uh, giving each other uh, the path where you're going. There's like trust and recognition by the others. So that's uh, very important and it's part of the learning process that uh, you all set up. So I think this goes very deep into, into people. And uh, I wonder if, uh, do you believe that uh, these networks and uh, going in, into, into them is for everyone? Any kind of professional and pre um, personal profile? So what are your experiences? Do you have people that just, uh, just join you and at some point say, guys, this is, no, this is not my place. Goodbye. <laughs> because at Wizard we have it all the time. And <laughs> uh, yeah, we have it all the time too. So I think, um, I guess I think of myself as an example, as someone, I was working in advertising consulting in London and it was very much the sort of like hamster wheel version of life where you go to work and you go home and you complain about work and you're like, actually life should be different and I want to work in a different way. And I ended up moving back to New Zealand uh, two and a half years ago and I had heard about the Inspiral Network but didn't quite know how to engage because I think it can be a bit amorphous and I don't know if it's similar with WeShare, um, but I guess it's, it can be hard to find a way in, and uh, I was lucky enough that Lifehack at the time had a job opening, which I applied for, and I remember walking into Inspiral Space, which at the time was the physical co-working space that we had, and just feeling like that was, that was my people, that I had arrived feeling like I don't actually need to look much further for the people I want to be hanging out with, but they're largely in this room and sort of in, on the periphery of this. And for me, it really worked. It was a, it, it was a way of working that was self-managing, that was without hierarchy necessarily that was without sort of the bosses telling us what to do but us co-creating what it is that we were working for and I really thrived in it and it really really worked for me and I can't imagine going back to a way of not doing that mm -hmm. but at the same time um, and I think for me this goes back to the the readiness piece I think some people are just their, their penny is about to drop and they show up and it really really works for them and it just feels like a missing part to their like puzzle of life and I think other people like the idea and like the idea of working in a self-managing way and setting your own deadlines and you know working to your own budgets and and all of those things only to realize that actually what they really need is um 
somebody to give them direction. And so at times that is something that we can do in the network, but also um, it is, like I was saying earlier, often quite a deep end approach to creating your own work, um, which I don't think suits everyone. Um, so I do think there are people who show up and they stick around for a while and try it out and work out it's not for them and that's completely fine. And it's, you know, they're still friends of the network or still engage in the ways that suit them, but it, they don't necessarily make it their main way of working, but are still around and still support and we support them. Because it seems like a, it's like a personal growth in there that not everyone wants to face in this way. So loose and times and... Yeah, I think it is a really personal piece. Um, and I think in particular, like it's something quite hyped about, you know, like we're here at a festival discussing it, I guess, so, or at a conference. And so is it the next thing that people want to strive to be, but actually it, it doesn't work for everyone or there's, there's an element of uncertainty or not necessarily going, knowing exactly where you're going, which can cause people to be uncomfortable. And I think at times being uncomfortable is really, really valuable and it stretches who we are and how, how we are. Um, but sometimes the moment isn't right um, in, in a person's life. So it might be that they show up again at a later stage or find a different way of, of finding something that works for them. Mm -hmm. How we see in All right, Cocoon? first of all, I totally agree with Gina. So if I think about Cocoon projects, I will probably repeat what she already said. So I like this thing about timing because these kind of systems are in flow continuously emerging different dynamics and so it depends on the moment for the system and the moment for yourself so you you need a match so if you look for the perspective of a single of organization like this it's not for everybody for example for Kogun if you don't care about our work what we do so probably it's not the right place up front and then it depends also on your will to be in an emergent system but if, you, if the question is broader, like, for example, about Endor, or in general, if this kind of system are for everybody, the answer to me is definitely yes. For a very simple reason, I believe there is a very intimate relationship between the mankind and the tools they de we devise. All right? So it's a two-way mm, relationship. So we devise the tools that we need to evolve, and, and then the tools that we would devise also... Um, change the way we work, we think, and we evolve at the very end. This is Marshall McLuhan stuff. We've been talking about it, but I will cut that short. I love this topic. So what is happening now is that we are devising new kind of organizations, so new tools. And if we're doing that, it's because we need that. So I think this is a moment in which this onlyness that I've, I've been hearing, which I love as a concept, is not the onlyness of the person, it's the onlyness, the onlyness of the personal path. And there is nothing like a, such a system to help you through that path in an emergent way, which is similar to the emergent way of our life. There is nothing planable and, 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 and mechanistic in our life. So you need, in order to grow in that way, which is what we do, which, I mean, as, especially in this moment in time, we have, we're facing an identity problem as mankind, definitely. So we need, we all need to be in such kind of th systems. Then maybe in one moment can be we share for me, then, then it can be Cocoon, then it can be in Spiral. That's another topic. Mm -hmm. But the, the reality, so Endor, I, I understand that comes from probably um, things that you're missing on this process of, uh, of learning, of uh, growth within Cocoon. So Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, uh, at the very beginning we had like three customer segments we wanted to work for in Cocoon. One was the established enterprises, the other startups. Enterprises, no, established organizations, startups, and then individuals in their mm -hmm. professional growth in that case. We dropped that because we were focusing more, we needed more focus in order to work better. So we dropped that part and then, it, you know, it, we let that out the door and went back in through the window because we ended up needing that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So since our job is to help organization in their evolution and not working with the growth of individuals, which is similar but is not the same thing, then we felt this need to build something that reproduced what we already have done in, in a few times in Cocoon. We've, we have seen how people 
actually can grow in such a system, but then we cannot focus on that because we're doing other, other things. So we're spinning off and focusing mm -hmm. on that with another organization mm -hmm. that will do just that and not just for us at the point. I, I think that it's something that can really scale up well, where the platform can be the source of a very powerful network effect. So if I asked you, imagine that I can give you whatever resources for you to be happy. What would you need? What do I need? Yes. Whatever resources to be happy. I need love. Yes. I need uh, recognition. So what you need are, are, are relationships, are, are people. So probably you need money. But what if we can build up a society in which money is just one of the parts and we can exchange not necessarily measure, but exchange other value flows. So this is what we're going to build. We're going to build something in which, for example, the business model, the revenue model is pay, as, pay what you want. Mm -hmm. Simply, simply like that. And then there is um, a life cycle for these experiences of growth that is connected, is related to how much people are taking out of them. So it's like, it's like uh, Darwinian. So the, the ones that are not useful would just die and that can be rebirth. So the idea is to provide that network resources you're talking about. So meeting the right contexts, the right people. John Agel calls these creation spaces in order to go through the power of attracting resources to the power of actually achieving your potential to whatever it is for you, which is personal. Mm -hmm. What about in Perestroika? Do well, you have cases like this as well? What? Do you have cases where... Just people trying yeah, to yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to answer you with the mindset I had in the moment of the question because it kind of changed after I listened to Stavio, okay? But, but this is a conversation. Yeah, so yeah. Th th go for the change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still pro processing it. Um, I would say it's definitely not for everyone because besides oxygen and water, I think nothing is for everyone. Even sex is not for everyone, okay? Some, some people don't like it. Yeah. So uh, I would say first because of that. Uh, secondly, because if we are embracing a more diverse society, we have to respect some people that want to work uh, on speciality, don't want multitasking, don't want uh, to work on uh, multidisciplinary systems. And there's a, a, another layer to that, which is the Brazilian society. Uh, because we are, we have different, um, we are in different stages, okay? So Brazil, there's even a funny story about Brazil's independence, because when you think about, like, the United States Revolution, who fought for the independence of the United States were the entrepreneurs of that time. And do you know who fought for the Brazilian independence? No one, because there was no fight. Who proclaimed it was the emperor's son. So it was very convenient. Okay, I'm the emperor's son, and guys, now we're independent, and I'm the emperor. So in Brazil, we have a culture that was to uh, get close to the court and receive favors in return. So until 2012, we had a major mindset, which was I want to work, work in public service, I want a stable job, I won't be fired if I do anything wrong, and I'll get my salary in the end of each month. Only in 2012, uh, we, we went to most of young people, 51% of young people wanting to, to, to become entrepreneurs in the next six years. So we still have a lot of people that want the com command control system. We had a lot of this problem. Someone that doesn't know how to work uh, with self-management and uh, um, managing their own deadlines. They, they need someone to tell them what to do and they feel kind of lost. And I was uh, listening to Priscilla's uh, talk. Is Priscilla here? She was here. She was talking about uh, the uh, human mind and how we can uh, download new apps because there's this operational system that uh, we come from our upbringing and our school and our families. So maybe these people, some of them can be, um, uh, uh, they can change that operational system, and some of them can't or don't even want. And there's another layer, which is some people uh, can work in a horizontal organization, 
but not necessarily in Perestroika because they're not aligned with the purpose or the way we do things or what we find is a, a, a grade 10 class and uh, how we work weekends and nights. So maybe he wants to work uh, more fluidly, but not in Perestroika. So I think there's a lot of layers, and so it's definitely not for everyone. Yeah, so... Sure. May I add just two things? Maybe uh, I didn't make myself clear, so I want to make sure I express the truth about what we do. Uh, we definitely don't go towards uh, necessarily cross-disciplinary, so you can be specialized, and we don't suggest to multitask. And I don't think we spoke about it already. I don't think there is such a thing, a thing as an horizontal organization. There are different models for leadership. The thing is if the formal system is reflecting the reality of, of the real system. The old way of the org chart was like static, but still you have leaders locally and in, in a platform system where you can grow. That's what I was talking about. You can have your place where somebody tells you what to do. It's not, it's not the opposite of being in a platform. Huh? Yeah. I'm just what yeah, yeah, I was I, meant. I agree with you. I agree that the system is becoming more hybrid, more fluid, but I think I meant a more horizontal system. Right. Uh, no, I, and I think um, exactly it's like, uh, and I also agree with you that uh, not everyone wants to be changed. So it's a it seems like there's a need for everyone to, to get tools uh, in their own evolution, personal growth, learning process. But uh, definitely some people really don't want, especially in this way of, uh, that uh, these networks require that in, in, in general are, are very loose. The, this before we were having lunch and uh, we were talking about that there's some hardness, uh, something hard uh, within which as, a, as an organization. And it's because you're fa facing yourself. And uh, you, you cannot look in anywhere and say, okay, it's your fault. No, 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 it's, it's, it's you. So, and, and that's a little bit hard and some people don't just don't like that. So I think, uh, in, in, in my own experience, that's, the, that's the, the conclusion that I get. And uh, yeah, I, I would agree. And I think for me, work is hard every day. Like I, I think um, not necessarily within Inspiral, but also within Lifehack, it just feels like we're, we're creating a new way of working overall. Uh, in Lifehack in particular, it's blending different disciplines between well-being science and design and technology. Um, and so we're making it up every day on the evidence that we're creating, but at the same time, it also means that only by looking back am I seeing what I've learned? Because every day feels hard, so only by looking back at myself and what I've done in the time and the growth that I've gone through, um, does, it, does it make sense? So I think it's also, I think in this work, when it feels difficult, what are the moments that we can take or the rituals that we need to have as a network, as an institution, an organization, a platform, whatever you want to call yourself, of um, yeah, that feedback loop for ourselves in acknowledging that what we're doing is a bit different and maybe we are creating new ways of working or maybe they're not so new after all, but it feels new at this point in time to us. Uh, yeah, so what can we do for ourselves and one another to help us see the work that we're each doing and creating? Thank you very much. I don't know if you have anything to add. I think we run it after, after time. Would you like to add? Uh, we can sneak a little bit of time. Yeah, sure. Please. Just one small thing. Yes. I, I feel that m there might be a little confusion between the organizational model of, of, of a scope of an institution and being a platform. So being a platform, as far as I, I mean, uh, for what I mean, means exactly what you need. So it means that you can use what is in the platform for expressing the best of you. It's not that you are forced to grow when you don't want to grow. So this is a very important point. Then the dynamics can be long discussed, but this is very important. So whatever organizational model, even the most liquid one, is something that you need to accept and find yourself comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So, but on the other hand, a platform, and I'm in this time I'm speaking about Endor, for example, mm -hmm. is something that must allow each person to work in its own way or even other organization to do that. That's being a platform. It's like being an airport for different airplanes. So uh, that should give you the possibility of growing as you need, not as forcing you in growing when you don't want to. It's very important for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to introduce something and then we can continue the conversation here at the terrace so we can go. So um, 
Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. But uh, I also think that uh, in the moment that um, it's very, what I find is like uh, in general, people like the idea of uh, how we work as a, as a platforms. Uh, because, uh, yeah, this, uh, this uh, resona uh, something resonates uh, inside of us saying like, oh, that's, that's interesting because uh, it allows me to feel free. But it's very different when you actually are going through it. So that's the real challenge, I think. But we can continue the conversation now in the terrace. So whoever wants to join uh, is more than welcome. So I want uh, to thank you very much to be here today. Thank you. And. Um, <laughs>